Now I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Boss, who is going to be talking for a while about ambiguous loss. Yes. Good morning. I want to begin today with something unusual. Um, I'm in the ninth day of a bad cold, and so I may have a coughing spell, and I don't want you to worry about it if I do. It'll sound terrible, but I will need to cough, and then I will be back. So, but know that I have um, lemon and honey here, and I have water, and I'm taking anti-cough drops, so we'll see. One other um, piece of business before I start. I brought two books that I think are relevant for um, what you do, the wonderful work you do here at Wilder, and I'll leave them here for your library. Uh, the first one is Ambiguous Loss, which is the first book I wrote about the theory. Essentially, it says the phenomenon exists, and, and that's all it says, because in uh, 1999, a lot of people didn't think it did. So, and Harvard was the publisher of that book. Uh, in 2006, when I was a visiting professor at Hunter uh, in New York City, I wrote this book for professionals. This says, what do you do about it? So, depending on what you want, this is certainly readable by lay people and translated into many different languages, as is this. And I will just leave them here for now. <laughs> OK. I think we can begin. What is the link between parental incarceration and ambiguous loss? Well, parental incarceration is, for the child, an ambiguous loss. No one has died. The, the, the parent is there, but not there. They are physically absent, but kept psychologically present, because no one has died. Uh, why the ambiguous loss lens helps? Why does it help? It helps because it gives a name to the phenomenon and the stress that the child is feeling. They don't know why they feel sad or angry or grieving or acting out. And therefore, it helps to cope if you know what the problem is. Uh, from your, your college of uh, Psych 101, you know that Lazarus said, you can't cope with anything until you know what it is. That's very true for kids. So it, it behooves us to label what is stressing them. And I prefer to do that in a non-blame way, not to say what is stressing you is the fact that your father or mother is in prison. They already know that. I wouldn't say that. What is stressing you is ambiguous loss. It is the most difficult loss there is because there is no closure. It continues on and on without resolution. It may be resolved when that person comes back home in this case. The fact is, everybody may be different by that time. The kid may be older, and the person who was in prison may be different. So the loss essentially goes on forever. By the way, children like the concept of ambiguous loss. They caught on to it quicker than adults did primarily because they're not so resistant to the idea of ambiguity. They like it. Other people who caught on to it early were artists and musicians and poets, painters. They like ambiguity because they think it's the most interesting part of art. Um, for these kids, it isn't interesting. It's stressful. Uh, but if you label it, they will literally, in front of you, have a sigh of relief that what they're feeling has a name, and it's not a bad name. It's not out of DSM-5. 
uh, it is based, stress based. It is a stress based phenomenon, not psychiatric. So ambiguous loss gives a name to the stressor. The origin of the term, uh, my, my first thought was uh, way back in the 70s when I was a graduate student down in Madison at the University of Wisconsin, uh, was that I saw it in corporate executive families where the businessman was gone all the time. He was there but not there. And in fact, when he came home, the kids would say he has his head in the briefcase. Well, that just never went anywhere because as a grad student, when I gave my first paper, the military was in the audience. This was the Vietnam era. And they said, your theory fits our data. Uh, would you do your doctorate with us? And that was the Center for Prisoner of War Studies in San Diego. And they had the sample of the families of the men who were missing in action in Vietnam and Southeast Asia at that time. Um, Paul Matesic and I had the same mentor at that time, Reuben Hill, who was their uh, consultant. So that is how I got tied up with Reuben Hill as well. So my first research was with the families of the missing in action. And subsequently, I also studied the other side of it, where the mind is missing, such as addiction. Or in my case, I studied Alzheimer's disease, the effect on the families uh, left behind. Uh, and today, the, the concept has gone worldwide and is being used by the International Red Cross and other um, NGO organizations across the world when there is a natural disaster that has missing people or, as you re hear on the news, when there are kidnapped people or refugees who, who lose one another. The problem is that the loss remains clear and without closure. The goal, then, is not to fix the problem. So you see this is very different from DSM, PTSD, et cetera. You're not going to fix this problem. The parent is in the prison. You can't get them out, right? So you have to fix, you have to teach the child, help the child to become resilient, to live with the, ambigu the ambiguous loss. So the, the, the task for us as therapists is very different. The assumptions are this. Ambiguous loss is a relational phenomenon. It ruptures human relationships. I don't have to tell you about that. You already know it. It ruptures the child's relationships. Intervention is based on the stress resiliency model, not a medical model, OK? This is not a DSM term. Um, we'll talk a little more about that later. Ambiguity complicates loss and thus complicates grief and coping processes. In other words, the, child's, the child must have some grief about what's going on if, if they cared about that parent in the first place. And of course, the coping process is blocked. You can't cope with something until you know what it is. That's why your first step is to label that stressor for the child. What you are experiencing is ambiguous loss. It's the greatest stressor of loss there is because there is no closure. There is no clarity about it. Amb ambiguity complicates the loss and thus the processes. The grief is ongoing. A psychological family can exist in the child's mind. Let's talk about that just a minute. The psychological family is the family in the person's heart and mind. All you need to do is ask them who it is. I tend to ask them to draw it out, a circle. Draw your biological family. That, that's easy. We can all do that. But then ask them to draw their psychological family. Who do you want to spend your birthday with? I usually focus in on rituals and celebrations. That gets to the guts of it. Who do you want to come to your wedding? Who don't you want to come? Those are very common questions, by the way. Who do you want to come to your graduation? Who don't you want to come? And so on. You, you tailor those questions for the particular kids you're working with at the time. They like to draw this out. 
and frequently, if you're working with whole families, the diagrams will be different for each person in the family. But that then gives you some clinical basis for working and moving forward about how they see who is their support system, who do they value, who makes them feel human and beloved. And that's a very important clinical piece of information to have. And also, we have to have professional tolerance for ambiguous loss. What, I've, what I do still, and by the way, let me just insert here. I'm 81, and so I want you to take these slides, which you have now available to you, and go ahead and train others. I can't keep doing it. Um, so in this stage of my life, I say, use the slides. Uh, edit them, shape them the way you want for your particular office. Train others to use this model. Because I'll tell you something, it works. It does not blame. It does not shame. It normalizes. And it is inclusive of all cultures, genders, ages, religions. OK? It's a theoretical model. It's not a strategy. So you have to take it and apply it your way, in your setting, to your kids and families, OK? It's just a guideline I'm giving you, a theoretical map. Did we do this? Yes. Professional tolerance for ambiguity. We all have to increase that. My background is uh, Swiss American. Um, and Protestant, Midwestern, all three of those make me want certainty. I want a clear answer to a problem. And of course, grad school supported that. You all know that. So here we go. Here I'm saying you need to uh, live, teach the child to live with ambiguity, not knowing if their parent is with them or not with them. Uh, at least they're physically not with them at this time. But here's the deal, and Marie Bowen said it in a different way. We can't bring our clients further than we can go ourselves. So that means you and I have to increase our tolerance for ambiguity in order to apply this model. And depending on where you came from, uh, it'll be harder. The, the more mastery-oriented you are, I confess that I was, uh, the harder it is to accept ambiguity. So you have to you have to push it. One of the ways to do that, Carl Whitaker, who was my teacher down at Madison, uh, you're not old enough probably to remember him, but he was one of the pioneers in family therapy. When he passed away at his funeral, his grandchildren got up and told stories about what they loved about Grandpa. And they said the most uh, wonderful thing they remembered about him is when he would take each child, one by one, in the car and say, let's go get lost. And I've tried it with my grandchildren, and you all should try it too. In fact, my husband and I like to do it now on a Sunday afternoon. Let's go get lost. No agenda. That's certainty. No map. You need a full tank of gas. <laughs> and I can guarantee that young people will love it. They love it. And they won't forget that you've done that. You, you start out on a journey without knowing where it's going to end. That's what your kids are doing. That's what the children of incarcerated parents are doing. They're on a journey. They don't exactly know how it's going to end. So you and I have to get pretty good at that, more comfortable with that, before we can help these children. So that's, that's enough said, but it's a very important point, OK? What is ambiguous loss? It's clearly, it's a loss that remains unclear and has no closure. It has no verification. There's no death certificate. The person is still there. It can't be fixed. The loss can be physical or psychological, and the pathology lies in the external context of the ambiguity, not in the individual or family. That last one is the most important. Because these kids feel guilty. And when they're with other kids, they probably are shamed. Your dad or mom is in prison. There is stigma. 
And so this, this is a very important point. There's nothing wrong with you. The pathology lies in the context, in your environment. You see, I don't say there's anything wrong with their parent either. Did you catch that? So I just say context or environment, whatever word you choose. The pathology lies in the external context of ambiguity. The ambiguity is the culprit, not their dad or mom, not the police, not the whoever they're blaming. The ambiguity is the culprit, not the individual family, and not the individual. Very important point. Two types. The first type is physical ambigu ambiguous loss. So you have physical absence with psychological presence. That would be the parent who is incarcerated. It also could be swept away by tsunami. I'm still working with the Japanese in Fukushima. Kidnapped and missing, that would be with the Red Cross uh, and dear Patty Wetterling's family. Uh, so I think Minnesota has personally um, taken that case as one we deeply care about. But there are many, many others. Disappeared, lost at sea without a trace. Or simply, and here's a more common example, a family member living elsewhere. Lots of parents go crazy every September when their kids go off to college. Now, my parents, being poor farm, immigrant farm family in southern Wisconsin, were probably glad when we left. Um, but that's not the case always. Uh, it also can be um, college institutional care. Someone goes uh, into an institution or a nursing home. Could be military deployment. There's a whole body of literature about that. Immigration and then incarceration, expatriates, adoption, foster care, which is related to incarceration as they understand it because some of these kids go into foster care and that's a whole other ambiguous loss problem of its own. And there's a whole body of literature on that as well. And then, of course, the divorce and desertion. Type 2 ambiguous loss is when the mind is missing, psychological absence with physical presence. And that would be Alzheimer's disease and other dementia, dementias, depression, addiction. But in this case, it would be preoccupation with the lost person where the, the child continues to think about the parent who isn't there. Or they may be home with another parent who is drinking, so now they have two ambiguous losses, one physical, one psychological. Could be autism, or more commonly, it's homesickness in immigrant families, especially with the parent whose relatives are abroad somewhere, and they don't have the female support system or the male support system they would ordinarily have if they were living in the same uh, region. And then we have a new one, obsession with computer games and so on. This chart is for you to use with families and children. It's the simpler one. Uh, and feel free to translate it. Uh, it's been translated into many uh, languages. And after 9-11 in New York, we had it translated into Spanish and uh, Russian and Chinese. Uh, just have, you don't need to translate it, just have uh, an adolescent translate it. They like to do that, and they, they understand this chart. And here are other family descriptions that physical ambiguous loss is leaving without goodbye, uh, gone but not for sure. That would apply to incarceration. Now, the link to complicated loss what you have here, uh, hold down a minute. Ooh, lemon. <laughs> what you have here now is a term that you have used with DSM, except that right now, complicated loss is in a footnote in the back of DSM-5. Uh, is saying that we think this might be relevant, but we need more research, more or less that kind of thing. I think ambiguous loss is a complicated, uh, it creates complicated grief. It is complicated loss that creates complicated grief. And I've talked with the people at Columbia who do that research, 
And so far, complicated grief research has been done only on families where a death is concerned. And I was trying to convince them to do it where there is an ambiguous loss, because their findings would be stronger, and they might get it in DSM then. They're not quite ready to do that, and of course, it's messier. Uh, and although it's not, uh, it's not impossible to do, you could get a population, for example, of kids whose parents are incarcerated and see if they have ambiguous loss. I would predict that they might have, especially if they were fond of that parent. And if that parent had been at home parenting them well, that is, so that the child was not abused, the child liked that parent, then the loss is greater, you see. The loss is, it's also complicated. With ambiguous loss, chronic and lingering grief is a normal reaction to an abnormal type of loss. Here's another sentence to highlight. It's a normal reaction. Their reaction is normal to an abnormal type of loss. Now, the abnormal type of loss is not the imprisonment. It's ambiguous loss. It's the ambiguity is the abnormality. And yet DSM-5 pathologizes all long-term grief. Grief that lasts longer than two weeks is labeled as a disorder. Depression involves intense grief that interferes with daily functioning. Well, eating, sleeping, working. Well, having a parent imprisoned may do this too, and that's not a full-blown depression. Grief contains aspects of the individual's existing disorder, which, that's a double blame now, um, you had a pre-existing condition, that's why you're feeling the way you are. Uh, be careful with that. That's a double, a double put-down of the person you're working with. It's a double pathologizing. You not only are suffering from a complicated grief or, P or PTSD now, but you had a pre-existing disorder. Uh, I know that the medical profession needs to do it that way, but if you're not in the medical profession, think about how you might work with these kids. They're already full of shame and blame all by themselves, plus the bullying they probably get. So try and intervene with them in a more normalizing way. But for family members with loved ones who vanish, in this case physically, also manifest these symptoms. We cannot label them as sick. I literally say that to people I work with. You are not sick, the situation is sick. Then they feed back to me and say, you mean I'm not crazy? The situation is crazy? And I might say yes to that, but I don't use those words myself. But essentially, they got it. It lifted the blame off their shoulders so that now their resilience can come to the fore. Anybody who's full of shame and blame, the resilience won't come out. They're constricted. And by the way, you need that. So how does ambiguous loss differ from ordinary loss? Unlike death, ambiguous loss has no official verification of loss. The person is still alive, in this case, in, in prison or in jail. The ambiguous loss, therefore, creates a, a complicated type of grief, but the complication is due to the type of loss, not to the kid's pathology. So I'm repeating the idea several different ways. Grief occurs even though no death has occurred, so the child may feel guilty <laughs> because they're confused now. Why do I feel this way? And so anger may, in fa fact, be covering up the sadness and grief for their parent being taken away. The grief is ongoing. Well, I understand that because for as long as they're gone. And with ambiguous loss, symptoms of complex grief result from the social context, not personal pathology. So now I've said it about five different ways. You got it, right? Uh, I'll go over this. Uh, uh, now, uh, 
uh, update on loss and grief because I think it's connected to having an incarcerated parent. Originally, the grief literature was focused on finishing the work of grieving. And if anybody else uses the word closure, I'll just scream. Patty Wetterling hates the word closure. Any family I've ever worked with, and I worked with hundreds, maybe more, um, who has someone missing, they hate the word closure. It's the public's choice of words, journalists, media, and so on, because they want to get over it. The public does not want to see suffering. The public does not want to see pain. It's un-American. Uh, we're supposed to be winners, not losers. And that's deeply embedded in our society, more than others, by the way. You go to Mexico, they celebrate death once a year. I mean, we can learn from that. Uh, we can learn from our Native American population here. Almost every other culture in the world, the Asian cultures have altars in their home. I go to a um, Thai restaurant down the street from where I live, and every day in the window, there's a fresh plate of food for their ancestors. Just think about it, people. The only people who want closure after loss, uh, I think, must be Euro-Americans. I'm not sure. Um, at any rate, we have to rethink that it's harmful. It's harmful. You don't get closure on loss. You get closure in real estate when you buy something. <laughs> so it's a perfectly good word in real estate, but not here, not with human relationships. Once you are attached to someone, no matter if they leave you like being imprisoned or if they die, they're still a part of who you are. Okay, so we learn to live with grief. We don't get over it. Now, originally, Lindemann, who uh, took care of the people after the terrible Coconut Grove nightclub fire, uh, where young people were at, in a basement nightclub with a lot of drapery, and the band used some pyrotechnics, and the owners had locked the exits because they didn't want kids sneaking in or something like that. So it was a terrible fire. And Lindemann worked with the survivors and the parents. One could say that he really dealt with trauma more than death. It certainly was traumatic death. And he came up primarily with the pathology of grief, repression, delayed, et cetera. Now, today we know that people who don't grieve openly might come from a culture like China, which uh, we noticed in 9-11, the Chinese garment workers in lower Manhattan did not want therapy. They did not want um, what the talking family meetings that we had with the Latino families. They had a room in lower Manhattan with chairs, and they would go there and sit. It was like a Quaker meeting. People sat there together, but no one said anything. And they could come and go, and that's how they found comfort. Now, what would Lindemann say about that? That's not repression, that's culture. Grief in five stages, well, let's talk about Kubler-Ross. She's a Swiss um, psychiatrist. In her defense, in her very last book, which very few people read, she, she said it wasn't about a linear stage model. She said it's messy. And she knew it was messy because she took seven years to die from small strokes. And she was angry probably up to the end. The reason people took her idea, which, by the way, was for the dying person, not for the family. So this may be perfectly correct for the dying person. I don't know yet. Okay, so we don't know yet, but she studied with dying people, and she may be right about this. For the family, let it go, okay? Honor her for starting the hospice movement. Read her last book, but don't perpetuate this misinformation that this is how people grieve. The reason I think our American society loves it is because it has an end. 
all stage models seem to appeal to us because if we go through stage one, two, three, four, five, we are done suffering. <laughs> so remember her kindly. She started the hospice movement. She did not want us to use this for the families. So your kids, they may be all over the place. Yes, they may be, have anger, they may have done all of these things, but not in a linear order. They, it's just disordered and messy. Then the focus on more nuanced types of grief, here's the one that I think applies really strongly to you here with your population. Kenneth Doka is a professor of social work at Swarthmore. Uh, he came up with the term disenfranchised grief. I think that ambiguous loss, having a parent incarcerated, that ambiguous loss is a disenfranchised grief. That is, the public does not support the grieving, doesn't even acknowledge it. Oh, there are no greeting cards for it. There are no support systems for it. In fact, there's stigma for it. So the child experiences stigma, not support. Chronic sorrow and grief as oscillation. I, I want to mention oscillation. Bonanno is currently the hottest uh, grief researcher, I think, and, but he's not particularly family systems oriented. Uh, Kissane is a psychiatrist from Australia, but he was in New York at Sloan Kettering, working with families of kids who have cancer. I really like Kassane. If you like family therapy, get Kassane's book. And by the way, at the end of the uh, slides are all the references, so you can order them if you want them uh, from your favorite place. Then we have a focus on living with grief, which started uh, already, uh, well, I would say in the 2000s. Uh, Boston Greenberg and I wrote in 84 on it, but we weren't very welcomed at that time. Uh, but around the 2000s, uh, Beck Farr, uh, who was a psychologist who, who believed in linear models and uh, the early uh, types of grief, her son was killed by a drunk driver. And she totally shifted and knew that you can't find closure. You remember this child forever. Uh, and with the people in my family who have died, I mean, I still use my mother and grandmother's recipes or tablecloth or my son wears his grandfather's uh, hunting vest under his more modern colored vest. Um, and the, uh, the jewelry you women wear now come from relatives. Now, I don't know what it is for guys. You're going to have to talk about it more amongst yourselves. Um, um, you know, my son is in Colorado, and we grew up in Wisconsin, so you may be offended by this. But he has his grandfather's rifle little rifle, and he just gave it to a grandnephew. That isn't what every family would do. By the way, they just hunt their meat. That's what they do. Um, but it may be a fishing rod. It may be anything. But you don't cut out people who have died. And these kids whose parents are incarcerated also don't have closure, nor do you want them to, because this person is not dead and may come back. No, we hope they will. So we had a focus on living with grief, and I gave you those uh, references. And then finally, finally, we come to types of loss, which is a new idea that people will grieve differently depending on the type of loss it is, clear versus ambiguous, volitional versus forced, et cetera. We could spend more time on that. The difference between PTSD and ambiguous loss. While both can lead to depression, anxiety, guilt, psychic numbing, flashbacks, and distressing dreams, the differences are here. PTSD is an individual disorder. It's individually diagnosed. It's individually defined. And it's individually treated, although there's a slight movement for family therapy treatment now, but it's, it's not the major intervention. I wish it were. 
The goal is to return the patient to health. That's PTSD. Ambiguous loss, on the other hand, is a relational disorder. You can't have ambiguous loss if you're a hermit. You have to have attached to somebody, and then that person is gone. Thus, relational interventions are needed. And here I would say, family, the family group is ideal, but maybe in this case it doesn't work. Then we've been trained that there is transference to us. And I just want to say, that's not enough. We go home. It's not enough for these kids. We go home. We, we don't take them home for Christmas or whatever holidays they ce celebrate. So therefore, you need to have somebody else in your intervention who will be available to them. Once I had a woman who had nobody, her husband was deployed, she brought her dog. Well, that's good. And she said later the dog prevented her suicide. I believe it. it wasn't me, it was the dog. Because the dog went home with her. I did not. So with these kids, you've got to have somebody in their neighborhood or in their um, extended family who will be there for them. Better yet, have them come in with them. Tell them to bring a friend, bring a pal, bring a dog. Bring somebody so this child does not go home alone. And I don't need to tell you the effectiveness of peer groups is immense. There's just a whole body of literature about it. Uh, the original one was AA way back when, but the one then that had the most research uh, back in, I think, the 70s was um, Parents of Schizophrenics. And now there are parents of autism, parents, all kinds of things. And you have um, adult children of alcoholics. You, you need to have a group for children of incarcerated parents. Is there such a group? Patty Wetterling and I just wrote an article on the effect of having a kidnapped child on the siblings left behind. Um, believe me, she wrote most of the article uh, because she's the expert. Um, she, I didn't know this, but she said there is a group nationally for siblings of kidnapped children and that her children got more from that group of peers, which, by the way, worked primarily on the Internet, only met once a year in person, that they got more from that peer group interaction than from any therapist they ever saw. Now, we need to listen to that. And we may need to, instead of doing one-to-one -one therapy, which is very inefficient, by the way, we may need to set up these kinds of peer group sessions uh, that will normalize what the child is experiencing rather than have them come to a medical clinic uh, which makes them feel like, now, my dad or mom is in prison, but now there's something wrong with me, too. So I would encourage you to find out if there could be a peer group of kids and adolescents. That probably would be different peer groups because of the ages, development, so that they could connect nationally on the Internet and then maybe once a year get together. Just, uh, just know that there is such a, pl a place that's very effective for the siblings of kidnapped children. And I'm sure there are other, other youth groups like that. So ambiguous loss is a relational disorder. You cannot treat it one to one. You can, but, but it's less effective. And it'll take longer. And then the kid goes home alone. And now you're an ambiguous loss. They have another one now. So what is lost? And these are things people have told me. The loss of, as, of my loved one as he or she was. The loss of knowing the whereabouts of him or her. Um, even if they're in prison, this child can't get to them. The loss of control over my life. I'm on edge. 
loss of trust in the world is a fair and rational place. That's a big one I would star it. It actually uh, erodes the child's trust, not only in their own family or their own parent who's incarcerated, but the entire system, the entire worldview has shifted, which is not a good thing because you need to trust somebody eventually or you can't, you're on the defense all the time. And loss of dreams for the future. Part of what we do is help them establish new dreams. The effect of ambiguous loss can be depression and anxiety, certainly anxiety, because as I said, it's a stress-based concept. You get stressed from not knowing. You will be stressed if you take that car ride with no destination. Um, but it's a mild stress. We need to be able to manage that. Hopelessness, that's a dangerous one, as you know. Uh, if there's no meaning, and the brain does not like ambiguity, by the way, so even when people sleep, uh, the dreams try to uh, come to some conclusion about certainty. My dad is here, my dad is not here. Uh, have a good family, do I? Uh, what should I do next, and so on. So the dreams of people with ambiguous loss could be an entirely other study uh, because they all dream and they have conflicted dreams full of ambivalence. Helplessness, not a good thing. So we try to make these children feel like they have more mastery. Confused identity, we'll say more about that later. And ambivalence, attachment, and frozen grief. Our job is to unfreeze the grief for people with ambiguous loss, to label it so that they can be sad instead of angry. Um, they, they can grieve the fact that their parent isn't there rather than being angry and acting out at school or you know better than I what they do. Now the difference between sadness and depression <clears throat> is very important here. The sadness is a normal response to loss. There's not much written about normal loss. It means you're mildly grieving and unhappy, but you're still functioning. It's oscillating, goes up and down. You have bad days, you have good days. But you're going, to, the, the child would be going to school, they would be eating, they would be sleeping. Uh, they are not in bed with the covers pulled up over their head, totally frozen. Depression, on the other hand, is sadness so deep that one cannot function, cannot care for self or others. That could be their other parent, maybe. Intervention for this, by the intervention for depression, is professional psychotherapy, family therapy, perhaps medication. What is the intervention for ordinary sadness from normal grieving? Human connection. Peer groups. That's why peer groups are so powerful. Social support and activities. By activities, I'm serious that moving the body helps the body to deal with sadness. You all know that about melatonin and all of that. Uh, I'm saying the wrong thing, but if you sit with this person, it's less functional to sit with a child in an office than to go walk with them around the block while you're doing therapy. It, it's the opposite of what we've been trained. And PTSD, they now know that as well. Very important to move. Uh, in New York City after 9-11, um, the only reason I was called in, by the way, is because the president of the SEI union his wife was my student at the University of Wisconsin in family theory, so he knew about, he knew that I worked with families of the missing. So he asked her to call me in. So that's the only reason I went in. New York has a very good therapist. However, they are all uh, doing grief therapy. Grief therapy will make people with ambiguous loss very angry. Don't do it, because they know nobody died. And so if you use traditional grief therapy, 
they may, in, in New York, they walked out on the, on the uh, psychiatrists and psychologists, and then they said, oh, these people are not accustomed to therapy and they're resistant. No, they aren't resistant, these people from different cultures. We are resistant. We need to try something different when it's not a death. And grief therapy will not work. What you want to talk about is normal grief, which gives, is always sad, right? It's sad. And this is what's happening. You're still functioning, but you have bad days. You may cry even five years later on a certain anniversary or seeing something. Normal. Kids don't know that today. They think they have to get over it and be tough. So you need to tell them that this is, this is what's normal. Now, depression, on the other hand, would need more treatment. But the majority of people will be sad not depressed, and that still needs attention, but it does not need medication. It needs human connection, not just to us, because we go home. It needs human connection with somebody they can continue to be connected to, like, ideally, a peer. There are effects on the entire system. Frequently, there's cutoff in families with ambiguous loss, rifts and alienation, Rituals and celebrations are canceled. Roles are confused. Who does what now that mom or dad is out of the house? Family couple boundaries, who's in, who's out, not clear. And therefore, the family decision-making process is frozen. This is not psychotherapy, but you need to work with these things, with these families, so that the family can function. It's really a more sociological, organizational intervention to make sure the roles are being covered, that the kids are not now becoming the parent, uh, that somebody's cooking, that somebody's paying the bills, that some, and I literally talk with people about this kind of thing. Again, it's not psychological intervention, it is more sociological organizational intervention, but they're connected. Assessing family roles, you can use these questions, by the way. Who is performing the role of caring for you? Are you taken care of? Are your needs met? What role do you play in your family now? And the one that would be dangerous would be if they're in charge. As a kid, they shouldn't have to be in charge. What have you lost? And you want to know that so they can grieve it. How do you manage the change? There are also family rules. Every kid knows that. Uh, if you want to know what your family rules are, go home and ask the youngest people in the family what the rules are. They will tell you. Who makes the decisions and plans for daily routines? It should not be the child. Is gender, race, age, class, religion affecting your ability to cope? The answer is almost yes to several of those. And then you have to discuss that. Is safety or poverty an issue? Frequently, the answer will be yes, and you need to deal with that. Is economic security an issue? I want to jump back to the first one, who makes the decisions and plans for the daily routines. While overall, it should not be the child. Now and then it is, and it's the only option available. And I, if you haven't read it, I recommend you read The Glass Castle. It's absolutely the worst family you ever. <laughs> you, I would, could not have concocted a family like that. And so the kids, uh, the kids had to become the sensible ones. And when I was at Harvard for a year in um, 94 to 95, I was at Judge Baker Children's Center. And there, there were quite a few kids who were the leaders in the family. And while we can pathologize that and say parentified child, now and then, that's all there is. And so you would support that child in whatever way you can without pathologizing him or her. There are always exceptions to the rule, aren't there? Family rituals are the guts of family life. And they should continue even when somebody uh, is missing from the family circle. I think, by the way, you may not 
you know, may not buy that assumption. It too comes out of sociology. Um, uh, it can be a family with nobody in it if all you share is the refrigerator and the laundry machine. People should sit down together. They don't anymore like we did every night, three times a day actually, around the same table. Um, I've stopped suggesting that. But I have, I have, my bottom line is you must eat together three times a week. Around the table, I don't care if it's popcorn where you sit together without your devices and share some food three times a week. I never thought that would be difficult for families today, but it is for many. And if you can bring it about, bring it about, because that means there's still a family there. If you can't do that, then focus on the rituals. The most important ritual, I feel, is the birthday of the child because it's the one that's aimed at the child. You are valuable. We are glad you were born. Somebody should celebrate that child's birthday. At Judge Baker, there was nobody left to celebrate an eighth grade boy's birthday. His grandmother, who had been taking care of him, was um, dying of diabetes and couldn't do a celebration anymore. So I suggested that the teachers have a cake that day in school. They thought I was crazy. And I said, well, you're his psychological family. He likes you. He likes coming to school. He stays after school to clean the erasers. Why wouldn't you just stop at a grocery store and buy a cake and bring it to school? So that was a new intervention. Believe me, those of us from the Midwest have our feet on the ground. And I tell you, it doesn't always have to be psychiatric. A birthday cake can be very uh, healing to a boy who has nobody else but his teachers to celebrate his birthday with him. So be creative, OK? And rituals are important. Uh, other rituals are also important. But I, if, you, if you haven't got many, focus on birthdays of these children. They are very, very important. And then the family comes together. And by the way, it could be the psychological family. So have them do it with the people that are valuable to them. It could be a teacher. It could be a pastor. It could be you. Have them bring cupcakes to your session or something. Rituals can be celebrated in various ways. Now, the most key intervention for working with ambiguous loss is dialectical thinking. I don't use that word with families. I use both and thinking as the term with them. And children catch on to this really fast. And you would just give them a few samples. <coughs> Excuse me. My parent is both gone and still here in my heart and mind. He may come back and maybe not. I'm both sad about the physical absence of my parent and finding new parental figures and social support. They, will, they won't even let you get to the third one. They like to do this, so encourage them to do it. <coughs> Sorry about that. Based on this both and thinking, <clears throat> which, by the way, I, you have to practice it first before you can get others to do it. So I'm wondering if you could just take a minute and you can talk to the person next to you and put down a both and thinking statement about an ambiguous loss in your own family. Let's take a few minutes to do that, OK? <coughs> what ambiguous loss do you have in your own family? And just make one both and statement about it. 